Hello, and welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the ups and downs of the creative process and how to keep it moving. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. I am a writer, singer, improv comedy newbie, science fiction geek, and creativity coach who loves helping right-brained folks get unstuck. I am so excited to be coming to you with interviews and coaching calls to show you the depth and breadth both of creative pursuits and creative people, to give you some insight into their experiences, and to inspire you. Over the last two episodes, we've heard from Todd Evans and Rachel Mariano, a brother and sister who grew up in an unusually artistic home and both became artists themselves. Today, their younger brother, Oren Evans, joins me to round out the family and talk about his experience as the much younger child, how it was similar and different, and how it influenced his career as a renowned jazz pianist and leader of the Grammy-nominated Captain Black Big Band. We talk about how he decided to leave college to pursue his career in music and how his parents managed to walk the fine line of being supportive, how limiting his options forced Oren to find ways to be successful, never more true than during the coronavirus pandemic, how the record industry has changed just over the last few decades, and how the opportunity to visit other countries has changed him as a person. I really think you'll enjoy my conversation with Oren Evans. Well, thank you for making time to talk to me today. Thank you. Thank you. So as as we've already talked about, I've talked to your brother, Todd, and your sister, Rachel. And so I'm especially curious to talk to you because I'm fascinated by the idea of three totally different creative journeys that all started in the same house. Yeah. And I'm I'm curious to know what it was like for you to grow up in the same space you know with with your dad being a playwright and your mom being a musician and then you know what Todd and Rachel were up to as well because you're the youngest right yes okay uh honestly you know you know (laughs) you start thinking about what I say (laughs) because I am the youngest and I don't want to hear I don't want to hear from my brother and sister's mouth. I'm being real. But like, yeah, we're not here to get you in trouble I, with them. I know, you know. There's things I would say <laughs> that I won't say because it's in the... But what I will say is that we... Um, I didn't realize until a later, a later point that, that what really makes us special is that we all grew up in a, in a different household. Mm-hmm. Uh, same parents, but because of the... You know, you're talking five years, pretty much. My brother, 1965, my sister, 1968. But uh, even though that's not a five-year gap, like my sister and I was six, almost seven between my sister and I, but that's a different household because my, my sister is, is a, is a girl. Right. <laughs> that's a, well, that was a whole different, the only girl. So she grew up and hurt what she saw was different, even mm-hmm. than what my mother saw. And then by the time I came along, uh, my parents got divorced when I was, well, basically around eight. So where my brother and sister had a, a how graduated high school, went to college with that family. Mm-hmm. I, I had a different family. I'm the only one that also didn't uh, didn't go to college from our family house. By the time I went to college, I had lived in three different households. Oh wow. So, um, three different places, not three, mm-hmm. well, in a way, three different households. So our experience, you know, is different as far as the house. Mm-hmm. But what also shows is how uh, strong my parents were. But we all we all had the same parents, no matter what. The, the extremely mm-hmm. supportive parents that came um, to anything we did, you know, and and supported what we did. I mean. Uh, you know, we basically all grew up going to my my father's plays and and then going to my mother's concerts. So we didn't really. I mean, honestly, I didn't know anything was special. You know, until <laughs> I, oh, I thought that's what you did. It's it's Saturday. You go you go see your dad's play, right? You know, <laughs> and I didn't realize until later that you know some other people didn't you know didn't have even my friends on the block they didn't have uh, parents that were teachers. Mm-hmm. You know, or I just thought we all grew up on the same block. You know, our parents went to work and came home. Um, 
But I guess later in, you know, life when I realized, oh, wow, we had like, cab- not cabarets, but uh, little shows in the house where my mother would invite singers over and to be a piano player. And, you know, so I grew up in, in that. And I, I, you know, and even as time moved on, my mother still did. I mean, she would do things like she would do things like, uh, you know, which I still try to do with my friends, a love dinner on Valentine's Day and, and decorate mm-hmm. the house and invite people over, you know. So all of that just seemed like things you you do, you know. And and I, I didn't realize it was special until a later point in, in my life. And and as you know, I think I think you can I really think the arts are a choice, mm-hmm. you know. I, I and I'm uh, cause it's, it's not a, it's not an easy path. Um, like other things too, but I think the fact that my mother and father were artists, very important to us, um, and, and to, to who we became. But I also think that it was just in us, you know, all mm-hmm. three of to perform, you know, that's something. And, and it just so happened that our parents were performers, you know, because we all have kids. You know, and I don't know if all of our kids are, you know, I hate to say, you know, I I see those artists who grab their kids and throw them on the stage and like, go ahead, do it, too. And it's like, they don't want to do it. (laughs) It's not (laughs) something that you automatically do just because your parents. Right. Um, The love for it or the respect for it may really has something to do with who they were. You know, the, the I still watch certain movies right now because. Uh, you know, I watched them with them growing up and I know the actors and, and, and different things like that. Uh, and so I, that love for the arts and even going to poetry readings. And I think that was definitely instilled in, in, through us uh, with our parents. But the desire to do it is something that's pretty much in all of us. And, and it awakes, you know, and, and sometimes you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to focus on this over here. But mm-hmm. it's all in there and it pops up. Yeah. And I think, you know, from, from different people that I've spoken with it, it makes such a huge difference if you are the kind of person who wants to perform or wants to be an artist of any capacity performing or not, when your parents actually have experience with that and, and encourage it rather than saying that's frivolous, that's a waste of your time. You should go be an engineer, you know, or a plumber or whatever. It, it just, it seems to, and it, and it makes sense. I mean, right on its face, it makes sense that it, it would help to grow up in an environment like that where, yes, you want to learn to play the piano. Your parents will drive you to the piano lesson, even if it's an hour away, because they think it's important that you do this, as opposed to the people who say, yeah, what are you doing? So, well, I'm, I, you know, this is why I'm, I'm talking to the youngest last. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be real. My mother wanted me to, my mother was an opera singer. That's great. But there was a point when my mother didn't want me to do this, honestly, you know, and my wife can attest to that. And because it is a hard road and mm-hmm. she, you know, I, her 20, 19 year old son leaves the house and says, I'm going to go play jazz, you know? And, and then my father, because he had to hear my mother <laughs> at a certain point was like, all right, son, you know, right before actually the month before he passed, I got my full-time teaching gig. Mm-hmm. Um, and I taught school for three years at Germantown Friends. I, I really, at that point, I didn't want to, you know, I really, I, I was touring the world. I didn't want to teach school. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I rem- I will never forget one of my last phone calls, might even, one of my last phone calls with my father, how happy he was that, because I had two kids, a mm-hmm. wife, I was going to have that quote-unquote stability at that point. And my mother too, you know, and, and I did it for three years. And I understand as a parent, mm-hmm. that the artist in them, that was the, the parent in them that was like, Hey, you know, you might want to do this. You got two kids and a wife. Now you might want to, you could do this. Why don't you go? Cause I, I left college to go on the road. Why don't you go back and get your degree? You can do this, you can do this. And, and, and I'm not trying to paint it as if they weren't supportive. Right. But they were parents, mm-hmm. they were parents, and and to me doing this full time for the past almost twenty five years now, and, and and raising a family and doing this, I had to fight through everybody, not just 
you know, I had to, cause I had to fight, you know, and, and when I say fight, I don't mean argue and, but I had to, you know, I had to say, this is what I want to do, mm-hmm. you know, and those moments when e- even right now, even right now, this is, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm back, you know, almost 25 years ago with my mother saying, well, Hey, you could do this. <laughs> <laughs> Because, hey, this is, I'm right smack. There's no, you know, unemployment for a self-employed person in, in PA is not jumping. Mm-hmm. It's not right now. So, you know, I'm like, okay, when is my next gig? I have no idea. My next gig may not be till the fall when they're yeah. able. You know, so with, when they're able, no one's, even if I wanted to say, which I don't do normally, but if I wanted to say, I'm going to go do some weddings. You know, no one's getting married this summer, so I'm not going to be able to play. Yeah, play they're it. all getting married on Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, all that to say, I, I know I understand their concern because I'm a father. My son is my youngest. Uh, my oldest is 27, and you know, basically, right now, I told him to quit his job because he was installing uh, in, uh, security systems. And I said, "Man, you're going in out these houses. This is mm. scary." You know, and and so now I'm trying to help him and help my youngest who graduates college Saturday. Wow. So the whole point is I understand. And they both picked things that aren't traditional. You Mm -hmm. know, my youngest son decides to be a go for music production, you know, in the middle, you know, and then graduate in the middle of a pandemic. (laughs) Yeah. And my oldest son just got out of the Navy. So. And and go let now let's go find a new job in the middle of a pandemic, you know. So yeah. I, I guess I say all that to say they were extremely supportive, but they were also parents. Yeah. So how did that? I mean, because that's an interesting line to walk for them, but it must have been interesting for you because, I mean, did it seem at all like they were giving you mixed messages, or was it? You know, did the fact that you knew that they were being supportive and you were just looking out for you not present that kind of internal conflict when you heard what they were saying? I don't I don't think they were giving mixed messages at all. Uh, they I just think they weren't. You, there was no way for them to know how I was going to make money doing what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. There was no way for them to know that, because even though my father you know, was a big jazz fan and uh, friends with a lot of jazz musicians. The concept of getting on a plane, going to another country, going to like, how do you get paid? How does that work? A lot Mm -hmm. of people understand that concept. And even though my father was, uh, you know, known as a playwright and and around the the world, pretty much, he also, and and thank God, because he set up a, a path for my brother, sister and I, but he also was a college professor. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a total different. It's not. It's not. The, it's not the exact same of like I'm traveling the world, just doing my art. He had that cushion, and and I thank God for that cushion because that cushion is what helped me to continue doing uh, what I'm doing. You know, when he passed away, it definitely helped my brother, sister, and I out to to keep doing what we were doing. Mm-hmm. But I, I think what they they just weren't aware. Of, I mean, and I'm I'm in the same boat now because I'm like, what are you gonna do to my youngest son with mm-hmm. a mu- music? What does that mean? What is music production? Because to me, you get a gig, you get a job, you go play. Somebody pays you at the end of the night. They pay for your ticket. They pay for your tri- like all of that is what I'm thinking. So what are you gonna do? How does that work? And I don't know how that works. So I know it works because I know some famous music producers, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm not, you know. I don't know how that works. So the fear is probably as a parent is different in me. Uh, to, and, and it's very similar to what my parents, the same fear they had because they, they weren't aware. There are two questions that are popping into my head simultaneously, and I'm just going to put them both out here and we'll we'll go with the, the first one first, I think. I'm I'm curious to know, you know, you mentioned your your father knew all of these jazz musicians. If that's how you discovered jazz in the first place or discovered that you loved it. And I also am curious to know what it was that made you decide that you were going to leave college and and go do this. So I don't know to what degree they may overlap or not, but you can take one at a time. The seed was planted by my father, you know, and, 
and that mean that was basically one of the rules I you know my family still deal still struggles with this rule but my rule was if you're behind the wheel you, you control the radio you know? <laughs> and and that was my dad and my dad also because he drove a stick my wife still makes me nervous the other rule was don't reach for stuff in the car like because you might hit the stick and i know my wife isn't going to do it but she still does it and it's like oh! <laughs> Just and all of it. I'm like, just it's just something I was re- like, don't reach over here, <laughs> right? <laughs> when I'm driving, <laughs> but so as far as the radio, that that seed, you know, was planted in all of us because we listened to what he listened to, whether we were driving a 15 minute drive or 20, and and, and I love that. I love that because it, it exposed me to a pile of music. You know, there's things I don't even. I didn't even know we're in there. And I say, oh, this, we used to listen to this on the way to the grocery store, whatever it, it could, it, it is. Mm-hmm. But now everybody, you know, when I started seeing everyone put their headphones on the first thing they get in the car, you know, or kids got that, they have their iPads and they're doing their own thing. Then I, I that's one of the problems that I, I think is going on with the music now with and not just jazz, but just exposing kids to other, other than the music they're listening to. Because they have way, they have a choice. Why do you have a choice? Like you're in the car, dad or mom is driving. You listen to what they listen to, you know, and you and you shut up. Like <laughs> you, have, you have a book, you have Mad Libs, you have a crossword puzzle, any of that. So that though that time growing up, um, I didn't really have a choice. So mm-hmm. that seed was in there for all all of us, you know. And 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 actually, but even a bigger musical influence. Um, was my brother. My brother, he blasted music when I say like, he would close the door and act like that was a sound barrier, which it wasn't. <laughs> so, no. and him and our dog would be in the room, you know, and, and when I'm, you know, my brother's 10 years older than me. So when you're five and he's 15, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I didn't, wouldn't have, Steely Dan, I would have known nothing about, you know, Doobie Brothers, nothing about, you know, so I was getting that from my brother and then getting in the car and getting it from my father, which, and if you listen to it again, what I just said, I got it because I didn't have a choice. I couldn't turn my brother's music down. Right. You know, I couldn't, we, and, and just as a, like I see the new parents sometimes, we're giving the kids way too many choices instead of just <laughs> saying, check this out. Like, I don't care. Check this out. You'll check this out. You know, you may not be into Miles Davis right now, but trust me. If I play this Miles Davis in the car enough now, when you're older, and you, mm-hmm. you'll have, you, your iPod will have some variety, you know. Yeah. So as as far as as music per se and where the influence came from, with those two things, not having a choice, being in the car with my dad, being in the car with my, I'm, I'm being in the house with my and the car with my brother. Um, I didn't listen to much music when my brother was driving because I was scared to death. He drove really fast. <laughs> I did when he was home, <laughs> but then when we moved, my when my mother and I moved to Philadelphia, we moved in with my uncle, and my uncle uh, was a famous jazz saxophonist from right here in Philadelphia, uh, not not well local, uh, really well known saxophonist around here. Uh, by the name is L- Ellsworth Gooding. So I was into music because I pra- but I didn't really. I wasn't in love with music. Mm-hmm. You know, was, music was some hip stuff. I could play the keyboard, or play the piano a little bit, but I wasn't in love with music mm-hmm. at all. And I always look at this one moment in my life. My uncle, we moved in with my uncle. Uh, I think it was a Tuesday. It was. It was a Tuesday night. I don't know why I remember this. <laughs> but it was Tuesday, I do know why I remember, but it was a Tuesday night we moved in. And when we moved in, I said, where's Uncle Ellsworth to my mother? I remember, whatever, 10 or 11. And she said, uh, oh, he had a gig. You know, he was at a gig somewhere in, I think it was Atlantic City or wherever he was, he wasn't home. So Uncle Ellsworth was, my mother was the youngest of 16, and I'm the youngest of three. So my parents were pretty, they they were older when they had me. Mm Mm-hmm. You figure they're older, and then my mother's the youngest. So my uncle, when I move, here's this 11 year old moving in with this. My uncle might have been 70 at that point. Wow. If I go, because my mother, yeah, my uncle was like either late 60s or, or already 70. 
And here's and it was, he was a bachelor. Mm-hmm. And then here's this 11 year old moving in. So I was terrified. I mean, he was always wonderful to me, but I I was scared. I'm like, oh man, here I am. And and the whole block that we moved on were all retired, either retired people who worked on the the, the ships in the shipyard or retired when they were in the war. So and here's this 11 year old on the block, yeah. you know, coming from a block in Trenton, New Jersey, that had nothing but kids, mm-hmm. nothing but kids. So I'm sitting. I remember sitting in front of the TV, like sitting Indian style, and didn't want to move when I heard his car pull up because I just didn't want to touch anything. I didn't want to move anything. You know, I was like, doo, 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 and I'm just sitting there. And he walked in the door with uh, one of one of his friends, and he handed me his saxophone and said, hey, take this to the room. That was the first thing he said to me. I grabbed the saxophone, I took it to the room. That was the last time he ever played saxophone. He found out he had brain wow. cancer. Ooh. And from the, the, the however, and, and then through, for all, through all that, he lost his teeth. So he never wanted to play. He never played again. He, he was like, I'm not, I never really asked him why. I was too young to, to mm-hmm. know why he didn't play. But I do know when it, when he lost his teeth, he didn't want to play the, the, the learn another embouchure. Right. He he played the piano. I might have heard him play the piano a few times in the house. Uh, but I always look at it at that point as him passing the music on to me because when he handed me that saxophone and I took it to the room, my life was changing in so many ways. One, mm-hmm. I was moving to Philadelphia. Two, I'm moving in with my uncle. Three, he just handed me music, and I didn't really realize it. Uh, and from that point on, it, I went on to a school in Philadelphia, and, and the principal, no, the music teacher there recommended a music school for me to go for middle school and high school. And I started going there and met other musicians. So the bikes and, and the dirt bikes and the big wheels were replaced by music. You know, I came from Trenton with no with no subway system to now catch the subway in Philly and meeting kids from other parts of the neighborhood. Uh, and so that was the first attraction to, to music per se. Uh, and some good schools here in Philly, Gerard academic music school, settlement music school. Uh, and then when I graduated, I went to Rutgers university and, and my choice to go to Rutgers, honestly, straight up, you know, outside of Kenny Barron being the professor there, uh, I could go to Rutgers cheap because my dad was a professor in a mm-hmm. school, state school. And so I'm like, oh, and he used to teach at Rutgers. And it was a good program. But the, honestly, it was motivated by I couldn't afford Manhattan School of Music or right. Berkeley Music. Let me go to Rutgers. Uh, and at the time I, I got there and I just the first year was OK. I just there there really wasn't as diverse as it became in the next couple of years. But when I was there, it really wasn't. Um, honestly, my an undergrad, there were maybe four African Americans in the music in the jazz department. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, uh, and one of them was actually an engineering major. There were undergrads. Mm-hmm. That were, was still in the music department. You know, so it was it wasn't my you know Saturdays would come around and I'm like. I'm on a campus that wasn't a music campus. I didn't really, you know, so I would drive back to Philly. I would always come back. <laughs> uh, and then one of those trips back to Philly, I went to a jazz club that was, that had just opened called the Blue Moon. And I sat in, this is the first day I sat in, and the owner comes over to me and says, hey, would you like to run our weekly jazz session and manage the club to do the music management? I was 19 years old. I never told him that. Mm-hmm. So then I started managing the club and booking weekly. So I was there seven days a week, um, making a little bit of money for that time under the table. You know, my rent, well, I didn't have rent yet. I was still in, at, at Rutgers. But my rent, when I did get an apartment, was only one week of what I was making. So at that time, how do you tell a 19-year-old, hey, you should stay in school? when you've already got yeah. a job doing exactly what you wanted to do. Granted, I wasn't touring, right. but I was, I had the opportunity to play music. I had an opportunity to learn from, from some of the older musicians. I was like, I'm not, you know, so I did that and then went to New York and I left uh, Rutgers university, uh, you know, and at times, you know, there, there've been a few times when I'm like, Oh man, I should just stay and knock that out. Um, 
But my life, if I had stayed and knocked that out, my life would be totally different. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have met my wife. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have the family I have right now. All of that would be totally different. But if I had stayed, I probably would be teaching during this this time, COVID, and I wouldn't be as wary. But mm -hmm. then I would have met my wife. Like, right. You know, it, and I wouldn't be the same person. So it, it, all, it all works out in the long run. So if you didn't really start paying attention to music until that night with the saxophone and then you got this gig when you were 19 how long had you been playing at that point and when did you pick the piano was it pretty much right when when everything shifted or did it take a little while well no the piano was i was banging on the piano in in, in trenton you know okay. I, I just i wasn't in love with it you okay. know that's all i mean if anything i was in love with falling off my bike and, and <laughs> be a BMXer. You know, I actually last night, uh, yesterday, ordered this movie called Rad that I felt like I used to love. It was all about BMXing. But it was a bootleg copy, and I got mad and turned it off. So <laughs> like Amazon. But that was my love, you know. And, and when I got to Philly, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to do that too. But there were no kids on the block, you know. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much that I, then I started playing music. It was just, oh, okay. Well, now let me deal with this. This is fun, you know, get a little Casio keyboard with a drum pad on it. Mm -hmm. So it was really just continuing what, if you call some of my friends that I grew up with in Trenton, they all would say, I remember you banging on the piano. And I mean, it was, I was, I didn't know per se what I was doing, mm -hmm. but back then I still don't know what I'm doing, but the piano... <laughs> It was definitely something I had already been doing. And, and then by the sixth grade, when I met that teacher, it just, you know, more and more and more, I fell in love with jazz per se, too. Okay. Because that's, that's incredible to be 19 and be handed an opportunity like that. I, I can't blame you for saying I'd rather do this than stay in school. I really can't. Right, right. I, yeah, I mean, until the club closed and I was like, now what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But but actually, by the time the club closed, I had already met my wife and moved to New York. So it all, you know, and that's that's the struggle. Actually, circling back, that's the struggle as a parent that I'm, you know, I have to remember. Shoot, my wife at whatever twenty said I'm moving to Europe, you know, and her parents was like what? And she went to Europe, you Good know, to travel around Europe. And so, as a parent now. I, I understand, you know, I really do understand what my what my parents were going through at times. They were, as I said, extremely supportive, but there were times when they were, oh man, look, you know, now you got, now you got these two kids, now you got this, now you got this. I'm like, yep. And now I got to figure out a way to do it, doing this, you know, and that that's the key thing, just having a, uh, and, and this is something I didn't realize, but the Pat, having a business plan point blank, whether you're playing music, whether you're an artist or whether you're opening a store or whether you're, whatever you're doing, it's a business. This mm -hmm. is a, this is a business for me. So I had to sit down and figure out how am I going to make, you know, and even with this new pandemic, not this pandemic we're in, I had to figure that out. I had to say, okay, I still play music. So how do I figure out a way to eat, you know, just figuring it out and having a clear plan, mm -hmm. plan. But and yet I get the feeling that a lot of your experience was pretty much OK. So the club's closed. How do I figure out how to make this work? Which sounds pretty seat of your pants improv to me in, in many ways. Does that sound right to you? Well, yes and no. There was always an, even when I was still at the club, I was building, for lack of better words, my brand. Mm -hmm. When I was doing the goal, the goal. You know, somebody said somebody said something to me the other day. They were like, uh, my top five. You know, they were just talking about their top five and then of something. And and then the other another person said, Well, if you were on a desert island, what would you take? You know, what records mm -hmm. would you take? I, I and I responded by saying I probably wouldn't take any music if I was on a desert island and, and never coming back because I don't want anything to be the last thing I you know, mm -hmm. even if John Coltrane's Love Supreme, I don't want that to be the last thing I hear. I, I'd rather hear in my head the future of what music is going to sound like, 
you know, because I want to see that it's it's going somewhere. So I'll just I'll make up music in my head rather than be stuck with my five top five, because top five means nothing else comes after this. Yeah. Where's the best, you know, cheesesteak in town? Well, it's the best for now. It's for now until someone else comes along and figures out something else. So my point in saying that is when I was at the Blue Moon, that was for now. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the name of the club, Blue Moon. So when I was there, I was already planning the next step. You know, I'm like, all right, well, let me do these live records. You know, so I was doing live records in the club. I was trying to promote myself. And immediately, I think the club closed in 96. And I did my first record that December, my first record on a on a label mm-hmm. that is 96. So it, the, my point is, I just kept trying to do something new, even though I was at, you know, Blue Moon or whatever you do as far as this music, you cannot look at it. I'm in a brand new band now and the band's been together for 20 years. I'm not looking, you know, that'd be great if I'm in the band for 20 years. That that would be amazing. That would be great. But I'm always planning as, as if I may only be in it for 20 days, you know, Mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean I'm not giving my all right to the band right now. It just means, Hey, I mean, honestly, we're, we didn't know we would be sitting home for nine months right now. Right. So so it's about just constantly planning, you know, whether I'm doing the, the blue moon and then going to do this and do this, thinking about what the next step is going to be. As an artist, you have, I mean, I that's what I think you have to be doing. This is today. What are you thinking about for tomorrow? Mm-hmm. What is your plan for next year? Even though it's, even though we're right here, what is your plan for next year? You know, and, and leaving the option for the plan to change. I think that's key. You know, if you had if you had a plan for this year that said, you know, in in May, I'm going to be doing this. And in July, I'm going to be doing this. And then all of a sudden the pandemic comes and you weren't able to shift. Yeah, that's that's deadly. It is. Yeah, it is. So how did that first record come about? Well, my first record I did on my own. And um, there was a record that came out by Keith Jarrett called uh, Live at Deerhead Inn, which is uh, a inn that still exists up in the Poconos. And I heard that record and I was like, wow, man, this is a great sounding record. I mean, outside of Keith Jarrett and Paul Motion and Gary Peacock, the musicians on it, I just love the vibe of the record. So that's kind of where I fell in love with live records. Mm-hmm. And- we called that engineer. I looked on the back of the record and found that engineer. And I said, hey, man, can you come record a live thing for me? And he did. Wow. Came, you know, and, and I scraped up all my little bit of money and and didn't use that. <laughs> <laughs> I still I actually just listened to it not too long ago. It's 25 years old, but it's fun to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um. And I didn't listen to it, but I grabbed the engineer and went to the studio and just recorded it again with, with three people I had been playing with for a while. You know, so two people, sorry, two people I've been playing with and did my first trio record. So I did all of that on my own, put it out, you know, and then that same year, or maybe a year and a half later, two people I've been playing with. In Philly, John Swan and Tim Warfield were recommending me for a label out of uh, out of the Netherlands. Oh wow! Called Crisscross, and they kept recommending me and recommending me. And then that first year, ninety six uh, December, I did my first, I did the first record the day after Christmas. So that was <laughs> my, and I stayed with that label for a few years. I mean, it was a label for up and coming artists. And I stayed with them for a few years, and then met a lot of people and that was by the time I I'd been living in New York by that point. Well, and a lot of people think that once you get a record deal it's all smooth sailing and you don't have to worry about anything again and yet it seems pretty clear to me that that's not how you've looked at this and probably not actually the reality. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, the record business has totally changed in the last Well, that's 20 true. Years. <laughs> so, I mean, that there was a point when labels were giving out big advances and basically advances like here, here's, you know, 10 
whatever, 10 grand, let's say that. And that's not even a big, but let's say they gave you 10 grand and you put your record out for five, then you have that, but you owe that money back to the label. So it's not like, and you have to do, you have to make that money back in record sales or whatever. But at that point, during that time, you could go and say, Hey, I just made this. I'm gonna go buy my car. I'm Mm -hmm. gonna do this. I'm gonna buy my house. I'm gonna put an extent. Like you could do that with that record company advance. The record company advance isn't the same anymore. We're we're competing with the internet. Uh, We're competing with so many other things. I mean, now granted, and I'm also playing a type of music that isn't giving out those kind of record deals anymore, really, Mm -hmm. you know, where we make, our money. And when I say we, I mean, people playing creative music and improvisational music is touring. We make our money touring and touring the world, which is why this pandemic is, is so deep, you know, because we can't travel anymore. You know, most of most musicians, the most, your biggest payday is spring or spring and, and summer. Summer has so many festival outside festivals. We all go to Europe, all of that. So this is the first year that it, ever i mean ever that i remember that the whole summer being shut down mm-hmm. so that's where you end up making money and, and and that's why everybody's thinking now and promoting records more and trying to sell their pro their their merchandise oh i got t-shirts because you have to think in a whole nother kind of way now you know it's not it's not the same as, as those record companies giving um those big advances and if they were around the real deal is you still should be planning as if that advance doesn't exist, point blank. Because what are you going to do when that record co- – I've seen how many record companies fold, you know what I mean? And and you, you, you got that money, you did it, now that record's over. What are you going to do? Do you know how to put a, out a record on your own? Have you mm-hmm. ever investigated what it means? You know, there's so many artists that were babysat by record labels for most of their careers – that now when the record company is changing in the dynamic, they have no idea how to put out a record on their own. So the key is just really investigating and knowing what's happening out there. Wow. (laughs) I mean, that makes sense to me. And yet there are so many pieces that it's got to be daunting for someone who's just starting out when they figure out that, you know, no, it's not, you get a deal and somebody takes care of everything for you. Even, even if they were going to take care of everything for you, it would be pretty stupid not to figure out how to handle it on your own. And, and so I would have to think once the scope of that hits you, it's got to be a moment of, Oh boy, what am I doing? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is. I mean, but then you, you remind yourself what you're doing. (laughs) (laughs) You just remind yourself, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I, this is one of the things where I try to limit. Man, this is going full circle. I limit the options. You know, once I decide this is what I'm going to do, I have no option but to make this work. You know, and 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 that's, you know, I, I said to my wife, there's going to be people that come out of this because there were people that came out of college, you know, after the four years and said, oh, I'm not being a musician. I went to a performing arts high school. And I can probably count how many people in my graduating class are still involved in the arts in any way, you know? So once you say to yourself, I have no option, this is what I'm going to do. The only option is success or the only option is eating and making sure everybody else in my household is taken mm-hmm. care of. That, those are my options. But quitting is not an option. So that means pandemic or not, quitting is not an option. That means record label or not, quitting is not an option, you know. And once you, once you really say that to yourself, and that has helped me as far as my mental stability, to wake up not only back when I was twenty and and, and late twenties, it's helped me this last two months to wake up and say, well, I got no option. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's pretty much how I look at it. I remember hearing. It's been a long time, so it's possible that I'm misremembering parts of this, but I think the, the story works even if I'm totally wrong. But I think it was an interview with George Clooney's dad, Nick, mm-hmm. and he was talking about the moment when George came to him and said, Dad, I want to act. And of course, you know, his response as a parent was, 
don't you think you should go learn how to do something else so you know you have a fallback position and george's response was dad if i have if i have a place to fall back i'll fall back and that's what your your comments reminding me of you, you yeah. know if your option is you know there's nowhere to go but where i want to go how do i make it work i think you're much more likely to figure that out well i mean honest the other part is if if your kid come home if your kid comes home and says hey i'm going to law school no one's going to say what are you going to fall back on right if, right if your kid comes home and says i'm going to med school no one's going to say well what are you going to fall back on or or whatever i want to be i'm going major in engineering no one says that but the minute you say you're going to do something involving the arts, they say, what are you going to fall back on? Mm -hmm. So I just, I had to, re and I remember an interview with Eddie Murphy, the same exact thing. He was on Arsenio Hall, but I, I was in college or maybe end of high school. And I remember the interview and, and, and uh, Arsenio said, did you ever think about having a safety net? And at that time I was having college counselors tell me, I need to have a high school to counselors, but I need to have a safety net. I, everyone was telling me, I, you know, you should do this. Even if the safety net was the difference between being a performing artist and a teaching artist, mm -hmm. you know, like no one told me I had, like I wanted to be a performing artist, but, Oh, you should prepare this just in case. And I'm, I'm like, no, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. And I remember watching that interview with Eddie Murphy and, and thinking, and he's real. That's messed up because everyone was coming to me telling me I should have a safety net. And he's like, no, this is what I wanted to do. And and I will tell you, not having a safety net, quote unquote, uh, is what has kept me doing this. You know, there were many, many times, you know, I, I remember and, and and a little bit of ego, you know, <laughs> it's just like, I, you know, honestly, there were certain things I couldn't do. And I still can't do because I feel like it would it would downplay my artistry. Mm -hmm. So it's like, OK, well, yeah, I could make a little bit of money doing this, but I'm not going to drive Uber and somebody look at their phone and say, is this Oren Evans? I have his record, <laughs> you know, because people have taken Ubers to my house. And then when they got there, they, the Uber drivers were like, oh, this is Oren Evans house. I have his. So I'm like, man, do I really? No, because then I'm also feeding, I'm feeding that, that dialogue that I was given as a kid mm -hmm. and everybody, oh, I'm a musician. Oh, and, oh, are you Ubering now? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, no, you know what I mean? So I have to really, I had to figure out how I could survive with my art because that's what I said I wanted to do. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm going to guess that at some point in doing that over the years, you've come up with something that really surprised you that you never expected or that you never expected to work. Are there, are there things that have stood out like that? It was like, boy, this was like a last ditch effort or this was a crazy idea. And I thought it was just going to bomb and it didn't. Teaching school. I mean, when I, when I, and, and I being a music teacher from middle school and high school kids from six to 12th grade for three years, you know, I, and, and the main reason I did is because one, it was a, job and two it was tuition for my go to this great you know private school and and when i got in there i said well, how can i do this and still play my music i still was able to tour i brought other people in uh i found a new way to teach so that it was different than the teachers i had you mm -hmm. know so that i could do more artist friendly teaching and less you know academia, you know, less of that and more artist friendly teaching. So, I, but I honestly went into it like, you know, a year, you know, and I did three years, which doesn't sound long, but it, <laughs> that's long. When, that's really, that's a long time when the road is yelling and screaming your name. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I can't go. You know, if some, I had a conversation with someone the other day and they're like, you should really look into this. And they were just talking about something else I should do. And I said, I can't do that right now. You know, I made an effort and, and I made a plan and I got to stick to this plan to do this. You know, if worse come to worse, you know, no, nah, worse come to worse, I'm probably still good. <laughs> 25 years later, I'm like, I, I, you know, and this is worse. <laughs> if, 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 if they're, 
there's ever been a worse, this is worse, you know? But, but I don't know any other thing I'm going to do. You know, this is what I'm going to do. And, and being okay with that took a while. It, it, and it still takes a while. Because you still have, you know, if you're at a dinner party or somewhere and someone says, what do you do? A musician. And they don't fully understand what that is. They're mm-hmm. like, oh, the, you teach it. And then they ask you some other dumb question to go along with it. You know, it's just, or they ask you, do you, do you know, well, my uncle played. And it's like, okay. What's your uncle? Oh, your uncle. Oh, okay. He was a hobbyist. He, he had an mm-hmm. instrument. But and so now you have to sit there and have this weird conversation. And you don't have that with, as an artist, you have those conversations that are just so uncomfortable sometimes because you're like, no, that's not me. But if you said, hey, I'm a doctor, what people right. say next is, well, hey, tell me more about it. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, or like, what do you, what kind of doctor? Da, 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 da. They, they ask you more about what you do. When you say you're an artist, they start to tell you what you do and they want to tell you about people they know. They, that do what you do, although it's not the same thing that you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my heart, you know, my wife is, I, even though I'm talking now, my wife is a little more talkative to, than I am. <laughs> so when we go to dinner parties, I, I don't even say what I do. When I taught school, I never talked about traveling, mm-hmm. you know, because one, I was 20 something. So this this young African American boy had never been to Germany. Dude, I had been to every freaking I had been all over the world. But when I went to those parent teachers meetings and they're like, Oh, we're going away for the summer. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've been there. What? And then so I never I stopped talking. I just stopped talking. I was like, I don't want to convince you that I've been somewhere or that I'm probably yeah. there at the time you're there. So I don't really there's plenty of times I don't talk about what I do to avoid those kind of conversations, you know? Yeah, and, I can't and, blame you. <laughs> and it's actually, it's actually translated over to my kids to the point that neither of my sons would really talk about what I do. Sometimes I'm like, you ain't tell, you, tell him your dad was a musician? My <laughs> youngest, he'll meet people. And, and I was like, hey, I know him. Did you tell him who you are? Like, nope. Because he doesn't even want to, like, I've had that same, you know, and, and it's funny because I don't, I think my brother and sister talk about my parents more than I do, you know, because Mm -hmm. I used to, but then I got those same in the circles that I ran, I got those same dumb comments, you know, like I, when I first moved to New York, I was living right down the street from the Billie Holiday theater. And I grew up going there with my father to see his plays done there, you know? So I remember saying once, it's like, Oh yeah, my father had a bunch of plays there done there and I've been there and then I, for, I forgot who I was talking to and the, ne- the conversation went for about 30 minutes about his oldest son who wrote a play for school and I was just like this is not the conversation <laughs> I want to be having so like let me just be quiet and now I wait so like I know okay I can talk about this yeah I, th- I think people struggle to relate because it seems so outside the norm that they have nothing you know they, they pull out the the kids play just because it's all they've got I know, you know? and yet sometimes it's like just tell me for dinner last night I'd rather have that conversation <laughs> <laughs> just tell, tell me what you you know I have I go to a look this local bar here and you'd be amazed at how many people don't I, I don't even say what I do. They're just like, why is he home during the day? Like, <laughs> I don't say what I do because then mm-hmm. I have that, you know, weird. They'll play certain things on the jukebox. I'm like, yeah, I know him. Or one time they'll play certain things on the jukebox and I've brought that person in there. Like, we've been there together and they've talked to the person. But sometimes you don't, when especially, especially with the music we play, you know, you don't always know what everyone looks like. You know what I mean? So you might not even know this person mm-hmm. or who or she is. So, I mean, I, I love sometimes just, it, it, oddly enough, just being me. Right. <laughs> and without being the artist sometimes or and everything that comes with it. Sure. So I'm, I'm curious how, if at all, your conception of yourself as an artist changed when you were nominated for a Grammy. No. And, and honestly, that's because, uh, I believe, I, I understand it's all BS, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and if, if now granted, 
that record, and we just did another one that was released on Friday, is a great record. But there's a bunch of great records out there. There's a bunch of great records. I didn't get nominated for a Grammy because it's a great record. You know, I didn't get nominated for a Grammy because there's great songs on there. I didn't get nominated for a Grammy because there's great arranging on there. You know, I didn't get nominated for a Grammy because the artwork looks great. You know, none of those reasons are why I got nominated for a Grammy. Now, I will say one of, not the top reasons, but one of the reasons we got nominated for a Grammy is dedication. It's been a band now for 10 years. It's been a, and that's a hard thing to do to have a big band and to put out, we've put out four records now and we are a dedicated band. And I think that alone is like, okay, so that's one part. I'm not saying that's the first part, mm -hmm. but that's two. We worked along with smoke session records who put the record out and put a lot of hard work into it. You can put a record out or anything, and you know, well, I'll speak record. You can put a record out, and it can be like the saying, a tree that falls in the forest and no one hears it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't promote it, you know, or if you don't have a good team that's doing radio ads, uh, a, a good team that's doing the publicity, making sure you're doing as, as many interviews as possible, if you're not part of the Grammy board, you know, they're they're you there's parts of it's just like the emmys and the oscars you know there's some there's some you, you're not going to tell me that early spike lee stuff should have never been nominated no it should have been but he wasn't the spike lee even though still he hasn't in my opinion still gotten the dude that he should but still the, now that he's older he's got a different team behind him mm -hmm. behind, uh, behind his work a total different team behind this than she's got to have it 30 40 years ago so the Grammy, which I nomination, which I totally appreciate, and I look forward to walking on that stage and winning one and and grabbing it, but getting as close as we got, um, I knew how we got here. Mm -hmm. there. And it, it wasn't about Oren Evans, the artist. That's not why we got there. It was Oren Evans, the team, and Oren Evans, the business model. You know, it was every, there's so many other pieces that, that, you know, there was conversations, literally like, we want to get this record nominated for a Grammy. Okay, how do we do this? You know, it's no different than I want to drive to Georgia. Okay, you set your GPS and you follow those directions. Mm -hmm. You get lost, but I'll get you to Georgia. I'll get you to Georgia. You know, get finding the house and everything else is on you, but I can get this GPS. <laughs> and that's kind of what it was. It was like, how do you want to get a Grammy? Okay, I mean, do you want to get a Grammy? Let's get there. I, and they got us to the door, you know. Now, the, the the next part is let's try to get in the door and win it the next time. Um, but I don't think it, I honestly don't, you know, it didn't change anything mm -hmm. per se with me. You know, it, it did definitely for the band that, that I run that got it, it changed the, the camaraderie between all of us. It got us closer. Uh, and I think some, some, you know, just made us feel stand up taller and feel better about what we're doing because it's hard. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a band, it's, it's 11 member band, and that's hard to pay, that's hard to travel with. And to get that opportunity um, really meant a lot, you know. But uh, no, we're still, we're, we're still down here understanding that it, it, it's a business and that's how we got there. Fair enough. Though I like that it brought you closer. I think that's great. Yep. That's a, a nice side effect. Exactly. So I'm also curious to know how, if at all, traveling has changed you as an artist. Um, I don't know if it's changed me as, as an artist because there's a bunch of amazing artists that don't even get as, uh, the, the opportunity to travel as much as I do. Um, but it's changed me as a human. Mm -hmm. uh, and... It's really, it's 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 just important. It's I mean, even though we're we're in this time that we are right now, I mean, one just to know we're in America. That's number one, and they call it the melting pot, which I hate. I hate that mm -hmm. term. The melting pot means you put everything in there and it all becomes one. 
you know, I understand that and it melts together, but I prefer a salad bowl. Tomatoes. That's just, what I've they, heard, and I think that makes <laughs> much more sense. <laughs> you know, it's like everybody just stays what they are, you know, and and and, and we all come together to make one great salad, you know, no matter what. So with that that being said, we're in this this country with so many different people. And sometimes we don't even we're we're not even familiar with the customs. You know, I re- and I remember I used to want to take my mother to Europe so so bad. I didn't get an opportunity to take her. I mean, she went when I was I, I assume she went before when I was little or before mm-hmm. I was born. Um, I believe so. And my father was in the service, so I know he went. But I I, I knew that there were certain things I was going to have to prepare my mother for that were like, oh no, that's not being rude. You know, like when I first went to Europe and I went to. I think I was in Italy and I went to pay for just a cup of coffee or something. And I went to pay and and the woman pointed and she had a tray on the table. Like they don't really, you don't put money in another person's hand that much. You put it down to me. If I put the money down, cause I've, I've done it when I'm in the States, when I put it down, I feel like, oops, I feel mm-hmm. like I'm disrespectful to the other person. Like, Oh, I could have just put that in your hand, but it's just a way in which that that was that how that's how they do it in Italy. So for me, everyone needs to travel because it would just shut down a lot of the misconceptions about people. You just see how different people do it. We we are so stuck on this is how you do it. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, even if it's even if it's pasta, whatever, this is how you make <laughs> it. You know, and I'm like, well, hey, that's why I love Chopped, the TV show Chopped. Mm-hmm. On the, I love it because. You don't know what you're going to get, and you have to make something beautiful out of it. You know, you don't get a chance to say ill, yuck. You have to make something beautiful out of it. And that's, if anything, why I appreciate the fact that I travel, whether it's from Detroit to Philly or Chicago to, or, or to, to Italy or Spain. It's just that I can see all the good parts of all of them, put it together, and make something beautiful. And and I think that is really what we need to do as a people. And we can't do it without some frequent flyer miles or some stamps on your passport. We we have like, and it's not as expensive as people think. You know, this is contrary to the beginning of our conversation. This <laughs> this is one thing that we have to realize we have options. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't always have to go to Disney World. You know, you could spend that same amount of money and go to Portugal. Yeah. You know what I mean? So understanding those that if anything, all my little talk about options earlier, this is an area where <laughs> options are good and you should just explore them all. I I agree. And I think that the world would be a better place if we all saw more of it, for sure. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I think a lot of us tend to just stay in the same place forever, and I don't think that does us any kind of good. Yeah. I mean, I think the cities would be a better place if, if people <laughs> went and saw more of the city. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. So one other thing that I've been wondering for a while, which is, did did your uncle ever get to hear you play? Yeah, he did. And and um, he's very, very quiet person, you know? And uh, I mean, <laughs> I ended up playing the clarinet too before when I and and I because when I went to that music school that I was recommended to go in, in seventh grade, they weren't prepared, they didn't have a mute piano teacher. Ah. So they're like, you know, so I picked up the clarinet. But when I would come home, I would bang on the piano all day. I had my little keyboard set up and make, you know. And and one it's funny a little things you remember, and I guess I had been playing too much. I had been playing <laughs> All day, you know, I used to make up little songs and sing. I came upstairs. My uncle, as I said, was very quiet. He just looked at me and said, I think you need to practice that clarinet song. I was like, okay, he's getting tired of just banging on the piano. (laughs) But that was my uncle, you know? I mean, and and I mean, pretty much he would always, and I'm kind of, I thought it was my dad, but now I'm thinking back, a lot of that was my uncle too. Uh, I'm kind of like that as a parent with, with my my boys, and I try not to be. I try not to be, but I learned a lot from the silence, um, from the men around me. You know, I learned a lot. Like my father, 
I love that he wasn't the one to give you advice all the time. You know, I mean, I remember when I, I just moved to New York, I'm like, what am I going to do? And it, whatever, if, if I called my father and said, hey, can I borrow $100? He would give me 50 mm-hmm. and say, yeah, and it has to be back by this time, you know? And then, and it made me like, oh, shit, how am I going to get this other $50? Like that was, that was a lesson <laughs> that I will never forget, you know? And, and, but he didn't say much. He wouldn't say, hey, you should do this. He would let me, which was totally different than my mom. My mom would have an <laughs> answer and advice before I finished talking. But <laughs> those, those men in my life, my uncle and them, they were very silent. But you, if you listened, they were saying so much, you know, and and that that was that was my uncle. So I, I never had a sit down conversation where he said, you know, man, you sounding really good, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I didn't I didn't get that. I, I did get you need to check out the choice in women you're, you're hanging out with. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's our show for this week. I hope you've enjoyed this unusual opportunity to look at three siblings' creative journeys. I'm so grateful to Oren Evans for making the time to talk to me. And as always, I deeply appreciate all of you who listen. I've put all of Oren's links in the show notes, so do go check them out. There's a lot to explore. Don't forget to tell a friend about this episode and share your thoughts with us on Instagram at FYCuriosity. Thanks so much. You can find show notes, the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up, and more at fycuriosity.com. I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at fycuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.